Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 692. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 15th, 2021. All right, welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted. We're halfway through October and got lots of news to report. But before we get too far, you know how this works. There's right in front of your face, somewhere on that screen, there's a thumb. You click the thumb. It's free advertising for George and I. Please share this episode with your friends, family, foes. We don't mind who. Just please share. I've actually, I can monitor the sharing. More sharing is going on. And I appreciate that very much. It's also free advertising. Go to the comment section. You've been doing that very faithfully. We appreciate that. Subscribe to the show if you're not subscribed yet. And we have a podcast for those who don't want to see our faces on screen. I mean, you know, look at the wrinkles, George. You know, I, I understand if you want to do the podcast only. George, lots of uh, lots of news this week. Kevin, where are you? We're leaving the Mammoth Cave area, and we're starting a tour further south. Uh, we're going to hit Bowling Green, Nashville, Pigeon Forge, Savannah, Charleston, and then head on into Florida, where I have a home residence on a, a cement pad. Uh, George, how you been doing? Pretty good. It's been a busy week. I uh, just uh, look forward to work this Sunday. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful life here in Florida. Sure. Well, uh, now we tell our audience when we need prayer. And George, you've got some muscle issues and you need a little bit of prayer. Uh, what, what should our audience be praying for? Well, four weeks ago, I uh, was cleaning, uh, clearing up a downed tree in the yard. A part of, a part of an oak tree came down. And Susan always nags me not to play with the chainsaw because I'm going to cut something off. Well, I hurt myself, but I didn't hurt myself with the chainsaw. I was dragging the uh, pieces to the front to be picked up, and I stepped in a hole. And since that time, I've had a really painful Charlie horse, which is a strained thigh muscle. Mm -hmm. And I developed bursitis in my hip. So the doctor gave me a cortisone shot in the joint, and that seems to have taken care of the hip pain. Uh, but the Charlie horse has taken an awful long time to uh, to heal, and so I'm hobbling around like an old man. And if you, if I'm a little slower than normal, the doctor recently put me on some muscle relaxants. Relaxants. <laughs> so uh, that and a fifth of scotch uh, really. Yeah, but geez, you know, <laughs> muscle relaxants and, and being a host on a. Uh, audible format show is not a good friend uh, but uh uh do keep george in your prayer uh you know th there's nothing wrong there's nothing worse than having a muscle injury um it, yeah i know because i'm i'm in my mid 50s now if my pillows are not in the correct position at night and i fall asleep strangely i'm out for a whole week you know something mm -hmm. back there's just not working and it's, it's an age thing it's hard to recover it takes a lot longer they say rest Ice it, compress it, and elevate it. Good luck, George. <laughs> All right, so do keep George in your prayers. Uh, lots of news. And most of you are tuned in for, for one story. And do we do that story first, or we save it to the end as a cliffhanger? Let's do it first. Um, uh, Michael what about Naz the good news story? Oh, yeah. Let's do the good one. The good new one is oddly a boldly story. George... Captain Kirk, William Shatner, the very good-looking 90-year-old, went into space with the help of Jeff Bezos. And uh, that's exciting, you know, because uh, the show appeared first in 67, 68, 69, and it was a, a brand new show called Star Trek, and it didn't really get a lot of traction until it was finally canceled. But all my life, I've identified sci-fi with... Uh, William uh, Shatner, Captain T. Kirk, and that, that genre until the mid-70s when Star Wars came around. And to watch the man who, you know, exemplified space actually get to space in a non-fiction form is really cool, George. Just imagine, uh, William Shatner was born five years, only five years after the first commercial aviation flight was launched. 
And now here he is in his 90th year being one of the first, I think the first, pa paying passenger to travel into outer space. Yeah. It was part of a crew of four, and I think three were, pass three were paying passengers to go sh uh, be shot into space. Um, uh, was it Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah, Wednesday, yeah, a couple, I think yeah, I think it was Wednesday, yeah. And yeah. I really, uh, I always, uh, I always enjoyed William Shatner. Some people like to rag him for being a bit of an over actor, but he doesn't take himself so seriously uh, that he's not pompous. He's just, uh, just who he is. Well, you can tell he, he reacts. You could tell he was a Shakespearean trained actor. You know that overemphasis, that uh, delivering half a line before the other half of a line. That's Shakespearean training. And you know he, he did it so well, and he brought that into that sci-fi genre where Shakespeare should not belong. Yet a lot of their stories in Star Trek were Shakespearean too. So, yeah. huh? well, I just was touched by his reaction when he came back down to Earth. Just the tears of joy and the excitement, and it just was a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. And. Uh, don't we live in a remarkable world where such things are now possible? It's just neat. Yeah, it is. I did. I have enjoyed. I have enjoyed all the Facebook memes of everybody. Let's dress up like we're characters from the Planet of the Apes. So when he gets back <laughs> from his trip to space, uh, so it's a lot of fun. No, it was a lot of fun. And, but I'm wondering if Jeff was able to charge the other two passengers more, because hey, you're going with Captain Kirk. Yeah, well, I'm going to charge you a little more for the trip, but you know, it, it's interesting. Space travel is now uh, commercial, and uh, we shall see how that plays out in the long term. Long after you and I are dead, something's going to happen with uh, commercial space travel. So, who knows? All right, here we go. Big story of the week: Michael Nazarali, former bishop in the Church of England, has decided to go back to the Roman Catholic Church. That's the story I woke up to yesterday. Uh, it was in my Facebook feed and my WhatsApp, and uh, George sent me a couple stories and said, you said, in a sense, uh, disappointing, but not surprising. And that was kind of my, my reaction, too. Because a lot of people look to Michael Nazarelli as an Orthodox Anglican. Some say he's a uh, an Anglo-Catholic Anglican, or was at the, at the time and that he represented our hope and our future in, in many different ways. And yes, there is an aspect to that, but Michael Nazarelli also, he, this is going to surprise a lot of our, our audience, he authored the Rochester Report, which was the uh, Church of England's uh, permission report to go forward with uh, women bishops. He's taking that with him to the Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> like you. Know. So hey, there's there's a lot here to unpack, George. Yes, it, it was disappointing. Uh, it was announced yesterday that uh, on uh, the feast of Saint Michael and All Angels, which was the end of September, Michael Nazarelli was received into the Catholic Church, and he is going to pursue ordination to the priesthood in the Catholic Church. In his, and that was a disappointing announcement. Disappointing because Michael Nazarelli had played a very important role in the fights to renew and revive Anglican orthodoxy, uh, the reforming spirit in the Anglican world over the past generation. There's no gain, naysaying his contributions. But at the same time, the sort of uh, Roman Catholic uh, controversialists, the people who are always attacking other uh, tr faith traditions. Their celebration and their claims are a bit excessive that this is the most important conversion from the Ang Church of England in X years since uh, this person or that person. Um, yes, it is important that Michael Nazar Ali converted and became a Roman Catholic as it is as important as a local dog catcher converts mm -hmm. uh, a soul gained for what the Catholics believe to be the true church. Will this affect in any way the Anglican world? No. Will it affect the Church of England situation? Perhaps. 
But in the wider Anglican world, no, it will not have any effect. It, it's a disappointing development. Um, I was thinking about it yesterday. The biggest question I have now is what's going to happen to the book he's writing about Anglicanism that we talked about last week. You know, he's writing a book. What's he going to say? Anglicanism sucks. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. There's a lot of problems with Anglicanism. Absolutely. Um, but it doesn't take too much to look at the first, second, third, fourth layers of Roman Catholicism and its history to say there's a lot of problems there as well. And if you're going to the Roman Catholic Church to fix their problems, go with God, my friend. Uh, Godspeed. Uh, because uh, theirs are beyond the documentation area. It's There's so many internal uh, things that are wrong with the Roman Catholic Church. And then you add the dogma. Then you add the Marian do uh, uh, doctrine. Then you add uh, all these other elements to the Roman Catholic Church on top of what's already screwed up. And when I sit down and talk to my most knowledgeable Roman Catholic friends and I ask them about this and, well, we don't believe that. Well, I'll show them a Pope two popes ago who did believe that. Yeah, well, well, we don't believe that. Well, the current Pope believes that. You know? And so well, then, well, it's not about the Pope. Wait a minute. <laughs> and so, y yes, Anglicanism has seen its better day and will again. Roman Catholicism has seen its better day and we pray we'll see a better day again. But you can't leave Anglicanism for Roman Catholicism and say you're seeking a more pure religion, more pure doctrine, more pure uh, church. On paper, it might be uh, a little bit more pure, but in practice, it, it's more screwed up than Anglicanism. Um, it, it just, it's, it's a reality. And I say this because I sent my son to, I sent all my kids to Roman Catholic schools uh, throughout their lives. And I remember sitting through an 18 minute Eucharist where the priest was able to enunciate every word through the Eucharist, give us five minute homily, get us all the way through and hand it all out in 18 minutes. <sighs> Just, there, <laughs> yes, there's problems. So, uh, disappointing, the, uh, not surprising. Well, let, let's go and get off of some details. Sure. Michael Nazarali was born in Pakistan to a Christian family. There is some controversy on this point, but it is said by some that he was reared or educated in Catholic schools and reared as a Catholic. Um, and so some are saying this is a return to the Roman Catholic Church Forum. Others are saying he was always a Christian, so this really doesn't matter. But as a young man, he was educated and ordained into the Church of Pakistan clergy. Had a brief career in the pastoral ministry and then became a bishop at a very early age in Pakistan. He uh, was threatened by Muslim extremists, and essentially, he, and he resigned his episcopate and moved to England, where he earned a doctorate and in from Cambridge. He's a very well educated man, very articulate, and then became the general secretary of the Church Mission Society, one of the great ancient mission societies, and that comes in the evangelical respect from the evangelical wing of the church and then was elevated to be Bishop of Rochester in the Church of England, I believe in 96, and retired in uh, 2004, I believe, uh, or, or later, excuse me. He was there a good long time. He was there from the beginning with the GAFCON movement. He was involved in various activities within the Church of England to turn it around. But at the same time, he was also involved in the mainstream activities of the Church of England. He was the chairman of the working group that in 2004 prepared what was called the Rochester Report on Women in the Episcopate, which recommended, recommended that women be allowed to be ordained into the Episcopate. And as chairman, he was basically supportive of its conclusions. Now he is... Uh, and he's written a great number of books on the Anglican way and Anglican approach to this or that. After his retirement, um, he continued to write and was an active conference speaker around the globe. 
However, last year, two years ago, when we were getting up the AMIE and other groups in England started, they were going to be the next day CNA. Mm -hmm. Michael Nazarali uh, didn't really want to play in that uh, arena. He, w he was approached by people we know and asked, could you help in leadership in this uh, launch we have in uh, the Church of England to not in the Church of England on the shores of the UK to help start the AMIE uh, uh, type organizations and he from what we hear he just didn't you know wasn't available to do it or couldn't do it or didn't want to do it so yeah he he didn't really want to uh, be part of the actual work of renewing and rebuilding the institutions mm -hmm. he felt much happier in writing about what needed to be done than actually doing what needed to be done and most recently and now we have this turn of events and in his letter and in the press release from the ordinariate the church of england uh the that catholic entity set up to receive and church of england members into the catholic church and also maintain their liturgy and some traditions and things like that he laid out in great detail all that was wrong with the church of england and i really didn't disagree with any of the things that he said he he, um, he knows what's wrong and my difficulty is he doesn't tell us what's right about the catholic church to the extent that he does not say i i've made a mistake in other words i am disappointed because i thought better of him and that he's jumped ship not because he says you know i've had it all wrong these years uh, my, my support for the reformers, my support for women bishops, all this and that, I now see it was mistaken, and I see that the Vatican, uh, the, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, is truly the uh, vessel God is going to use for the evangelization of the world in Christ. If someone has that conscious decision where they've arrived at the Catholic answer is the correct and only answer, then there's an imperative that they become a Catholic Church and leave that institution where they are. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing that out of Michael Nazarelli. I'm hearing, I've given you all these great ideas, the Anglican world, and you just haven't done what I wanted you to do. Therefore, I'm picking up my marbles and going home. Um, going to join a new game. Mm -hmm. So, what the, now? This involves my reading his mind, so please don't say this is news facts. It's just my uh, opinion that he never was quite the team player, never quite ready to go in and actually do the hard work, which means interacting with people uh, on a one-to-one -one level and in building institutions and building structures, as opposed to standing at a podium and telling people what he thinks. But you know let, let's be honest he did correctly identify what was wrong he just yes, did, the, he, he didn't offer uh a solution that could be worked upon by people like himself that the, this the in a nutshell the spirit of the secular age had infected the church of england mm -hmm. and he's now reached the point where he doesn't see any hope for it well, from my perch, I agree with everything that he said. The spirit of the age has infected the Church of England. But it's infected the German Roman Catholic Church in England and in Germany especially just as much. There's a synod starting, or if it's already started, in Germany that wants to have women clergy, women priests, women deacons, that wants to bless same-sex relationships, marriages. And it's going to eventually get there. It's going to happen. Um, because the Germans basically pay for the operations of the Catholic Church, so you follow the money, and so the and so he's jumping out of a sick institution and joining another sick institution. Um, instead of staying to try to plug the holes in the boat that is sinking, he's jumping into a, a bigger boat that is sinking and maybe sinking at a faster rate. Sure. Um, well, yeah, but, but, see, but now, 
again, we, we come from an American perspective where the American Catholic Church is the Church of Theodore McCarrick, um, where the big Catholic news of the week is uh, how many hundreds of thousands of children molested by Catholic priests in France. Um, so the, the position of the Catholic Church vis-a-vis -vis the Anglican way in the United States is vastly different from the situation in England and other parts of the world. Um, I really can't think of... Uh, uh, in other words, he had a course laid open to him, you know, that uh, was followed by, you know, Keith Ackerman and Jack Eicher and uh, people of uh, William Wantland and people of or Bob Duncan, uh, people of Catholic mind in liturgy. Um, but he didn't choose that option. He chose to instead go not into the Catholic Church, but into the Anglican ordinariate. So he's half Catholic, half Anglican. But under, but in that, but by, but you really can't be half Catholic because you have to accept the Immaculate Conception, the doctrines on papal fallibility, the sacrifice of the Mass, um, so on and so forth. Things yeah. that as Anglican, he wasn't really that uh, enthusiastic about. It would be interesting if, whilst the German Roman Catholic Church, is discussing uh, adding female clergy to the roles if he now opposes that. If uh, if he writes to the side where he opposes the stuff he wants supported. That would be interesting. George, I think we've covered the, the Michael Nas rally stuff probably more than we should have. Um, but the Anglican world woke up yesterday and said, what? And I, I saw lots of comments on Facebook who said, oh, I'm not surprised... I am disappointed. And that's, that's what George and I offer. If you wake up every morning, you say the church is screwed up. The Apostle Paul, the writer of Revelation, so many other characters throughout Christian history agree with you. The church always needs to be uh, at a place where it's in humility and serving the living God. It's not always there. George, let's move on to some more news. Uh, we're, gonna, we're hitting Roman Catholic news again. A Roman Catholic bishop, I'm sorry, I have some traffic pulling through the RV park here, has said that you, as a Roman Catholic, have the right to refuse the vaccine. And it, it's a it's a bigger story because he talks about uh, they did use in the Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh, aborted cells of a fetus. The stem, the the stem, stem cells, in developing the vaccine, you have the right to refuse if you want to. That's cool because we don't hear a lot from the religious religious leaders except the kooks <laughs> as to what you can do or not do with the vaccine, George. Yes, Timothy Broglio, the Roman Catholic Archbishop to the military forces in the United States, issued a letter uh supporting the right of uh service men and women to refuse to receive the vaccine covid vaccine out of a matter of conscience now broglio said he's had the vaccine and he encourages people to get it but he knows that there are people who have moral reservations he says now the moderna and pfizer vaccines were made with stem cells that are so remote from any abortion or things of that nature, that that the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, CDF, said that there is no uh, illicit uh, nature to this vaccine. They're fine. However, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a different matter, and that raises the, the abortion question is validly raised there. Now, quite, stop it for a second. The uh, Moderna and Pfizer uh, stem cells a whistleblower has come forward to say, well, they actually were made from aborted fetuses too. So the statement of fact in the beginning of his letter that Moderna and Pfizer are clean on this abortion level is now in dispute, but that's not the purpose of our raising this. The, what he is saying though, that it basically comes down whether abortion or any other moral issue is at issue, you have a right to follow your conscience and I'm going to read a portion of the letter. He quotes uh, Pope Paul VI. And in all his activity, a man is bound to follow his conscience in order that he may come to God, the end and purpose of life. 
it follows that he is not forced to act in a manner contrary to his conscience, nor, on the other hand, is he to be restrained from acting in accordance with his conscience, especially in matters religious. So what Broglio is saying is that no one should be forced to receive a COVID vaccine if it would violate the sanctity of their conscience. So this provides cover, if you will, for, I think it's only a small percentage of the armed forces right now have refused the COVID vaccine. But if they don't get it by the end of this month, they will be receive a general discharge with no military benefits. But this also applies uh, to firemen in, in uh, Los Angeles and school teachers and in uh, New York City, uh, airline pilots with Southwestern American Airlines nurses. It applies to all people that the Catholic doctrine or teaching or Christian teaching in general uh, gives recognizes the right of individual conscience. Now, there is a point that he didn't mention that I've seen raised, which I think is a good one, is that the Nuremberg uh, trials had uh, what were called the doctor's trials in 47 and 48, where the Nazi doctors who performed experiments on Jews and dwarves and, and other people in the name of science, they were condemned out of hand. And the Nuremberg protocols were released that essentially said that to, you must give your uh, it is a war crime, a crime against humanity to compel people to take a vaccine against their conscience, against their desires, because a human being has the autonomy of person. Now, that's uh, a, not a religious statement. That's a legal statement. Now, it came from the Nuremberg trials, which don't set precedent for anybody. But there is a... Uh, again, Kevin and I both have been vaccinated. My wife is vaccinated. My children are vaccinated. I, all the staff at my office are vaccinated. But it's all by our own choice. And I think the matter here is the coercion of the state or your employer in the name of the state to force you to do something that violates your conscience. You just... Christian teaching, as stated by this archbishop, is that you just can't... That's just not all. Yeah. I am, I am pro-vaccine... I am anti-mandate. I, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it's Kevin. I just, for some reason, being brought up as an American in the age of Ronald Reagan, I think individuals have some rights. And I, I, I'm sorry. But I think most people agree with me that, you know, we do have to have individual rights. But I also look back at my history. Uh, in order to go to schools in the 1970s, I had to have the smallpox, the polio, the whole host of uh, shots they put in my arm just to go to school. You know, and you and I have these little yellow cards that say we have yellow our yellow fever vaccine vaccine passports. Yeah, to go to Africa or let back into the United States actually. Yeah, after having and, been to Africa, and, and I would take the malaria, the new malaria vaccine. I would have no trouble doing so uh, because I I know people who suffered with malaria. Um, so, it, it, now, now to, the, this I is, would just add that. Go ahead. I am repeating the argument. I'm not making the argument. One of the arguments that people raise when it's compared to the, the universal school vaccines is that those are vaccines, whereas the Pfizer, Moderna, and J and J shots are therapeutics. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? A therapeutic helps treat the illness or prevent its symptoms or manages it. A vaccine stops it. And these are not vaccines in the sense that there are many, many people. I've got three people, four, six people in my congregation who have been vaccinated fully who caught COVID um, and are need to get uh, booster shots and follow-ups because these vaccines do not stop it like once and for all with smallpox or yellow fever. Yeah. They're therapeutic. You have to take it again and again and again. So that's the, the distinction that the, that argument is made. Sure. That we need no. that. We're not really dealing with vaccines. We're dealing with therapeutic drugs. No, and, you know, it's it just... 
it's a strange question that we have to answer in 2021 in in, the, in this century you know the the value of vaccines um and the value of rights i i i lift up higher the value of individual rights than the value than the value that the vaccine is giving us and i'm sorry i just do yeah. It's not been helped by the censorship we're seeing out of uh, social media and the government. And that people still get news, even if Facebook and Twitter don't want you to hear it. There's an NBA player who's had to sit out the rest of his season because he had the mandated uh, vaccine that the NBA required of all its players. And within a month, he, had blood, he has blood clots, which mm -hmm. have ended his season and may end his career that are due to his having received the vaccine. Now, I have read that not on the major outlets and I've not seen it discussed by neutral uh, experts. I've only seen it on anti-vaccine friendly sites. And I've seen nothing about it in the pro-vaccine sites. So I don't know if it's true or not, but the point is because we don't have an open and honest debate about these issues, People don't trust. People don't trust Dr. Fauci. They don't trust the government because they have had experience with being lied to on these issues. Uh, you don't need a mask because it won't help. Is what the Dr. Fauci was saying, and what he really was saying is that we want all healthcare workers to have masks, so we don't want you to buy them up. Once there are enough masks being made, you need a mask. I well, yeah. why didn't we not need a mask then? But now we need it. Well, yeah. because I was lying to you because I didn't want you to rush and buy out all the masks at Walmart. So the lack of trust is exacerbating this uh, pandemic. Well, it is. And the trust from people like Kevin, I am fully vaccinated. I got vaccinated in April so that I could travel and visit places around this nation. I arrive here to Mammoth National Cave. It's a uh, federal national park of the United States of America. And on it, the big sign on the front door says, anybody who opens and walks into this building must be wearing a mask, regardless of your vaccinated status. Now, what's the point of being vaccinated? Kevin's brain says. Uh, no, there's more. You are about to walk into the largest cave system known to mankind. 428 miles of uh, cave system is under our feet, and you get to go in there. It's vast. It's called Mammoth. Because it's a federal, we consider it a federal building, you have to wear your mask while you're in the cave. What is the point of the vaccination if I can't? walk around without a mask and so that, that's just that's where kevin you lose kevin's trust if the vet you know that and yes people are in the comments but kevin but kevin but kevin i know it's still a trust issue you can butt me all day long it's still you've lost my trust when you can't make make the good distinction of why i got vaccinated and still have to wear a mask so i um uh uh, in the development where I live is a Southwest Airlines pilot who mm -hmm. owns a house. And I always occasionally see him and chat when I'm walking the dog and whatnot. And he's been home last week or so. And I, I don't know him that well, but I just know enough to say hello and to chat. And I said, so, so what's really happening with Southwest? Are you guys on a walkout? He said, no. Um, well, what's going on? He said, well, there's some people who have walked out on the disease, but 80 but 80 percent of Southwest's pilots are former military, and they've come out of a certain tradition and certain training, and they recognize unlawful and authoritarian orders. And what's happening is that there are people who, out of principle, will not take the vaccine because they're being forced to, and if they're going to get fired, they're all taking their accumulated vacation time. And it's not a sick out or a walk out. It's just these guys know that they refuse to do it. So let's use my vacation days and their union contract allows them to take it. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much picket lines and walking out or the joke, bad weather. It's been great weather down here in Florida. It's anticipation of being fired 
which is now off the table, the president of Southwest backed down. Uh, but what you saw, you saw uh, basically Southwest Airlines conforming to a government mandate, which really has not been codified into the law, just a press release at this just point. Just a press release, yeah. Topic. yeah. yeah. Um, conforming, conforming to government orders and then finding that you know, only 20% of its pilots need to walk away, and they're basically, they're out of business. Mm -hmm. um, and then they've had to reverse that for business decision purposes. Because, you know, it, and, you know, what happens when 40% when of the firemen in New York walk out, or Los Angeles, are fired or, or take accumulated vacation pay and this and that? Um, the fire services won't work. The, it, the police won't be. Re you won't get a response to your 911 call. Not no, because I, the police I, don't want to, but because there are only three guys on. I, I'm assuming nobody from Washington D.C. is watching this. This is why I'm going to say this. Go out to the 30,000 foot level. In a year, we're going to have uh, elections again for uh, senators and congressmen. Uh, what is the populace going to do? In their trust of this government that is mandating the vaccine on so many different levels, um, I see another wave of 1993, which wiped out Bill Clinton's uh, uh, power over the the Senate. Um, if the mandates stay, and especially you, you watch in places like Virginia, uh, which has you know kind of been uh, Democrat for the last six or seven years turning out in Republican form and they're going to uh, maybe vote in a new Republican governor. And it's because of the things like the mandate. And it's not that the problem with the mandate in America is that you're forcing people to do things they don't want to do or they would do normally, but they don't like the mandate. Many pilots would normally get the vaccine. What really pisses them off is the mandate. So, you know. It's called the cons consent of the governed. When the uh, it, when the elites or the those in power no longer have the consent of the governed, um, then their days are numbered. Then they're in trouble. Either they have to move into authoritarianism to keep themselves in power, or they fall out of power. Um, I know so many bishops in the Episcopal Church, ACNA, Church of England, who are authoritarian and who tell their clergy what to do. And the clergy will only do it if anybody's looking. And basically, they, the, the authority the bishop has is not moral or spiritual. It's punitive. Yep. That can only go so far. And at a certain time, the people, at least in America, will stand up and say, no more. No mas. All done. Get out of the pool. Starting over. George, we have good news also province of alexandria had its inauguration so to speak uh tell us a little bit about that uh thursday friday saturday of last week mm -hmm. weekend and even on to sunday uh the province of uh alexandria which is based in cairo and covers north africa and the horn of africa down to egypt ethiopia egypt all all the way over um was instituted and you had a gathering of primates and archbishops, uh, Justin Welby, Foley Beach, uh, and other African at GAFCON and Global South leaders were present at All Saints Cathedral in Cairo for the inauguration of this province. And uh, its new leader, Archbishop Sammy, just forgot his last name. Uh, oh, yeah. That's apologize. Right. That's all right. Um, it was seated enthroned as archbishop he's also bishop of egypt and so we now have uh, 42 official anglican provinces mm. uh, we have some information we have some that are real but not recognized uh, you say so, 42 i say 43 you know it's it, it's a match actually 44 because 40. we're anglican church of brazil and that's the right yeah. anglican church of north america mm -hmm. functioning as provinces and yeah. whatnot and are recognized by the vast majority of Anglican provinces, other Anglican provinces, just not by the ACC in Canterbury. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's good to see the uh, 
it's good to see the development and being able to stand and develop their own ethos. Now, one thing Americans need to keep in mind is just because someone is opposed to the innovations out of, of the Episcopal Church doesn't mean they're on the same wavelength as you are on every other issue. And this was especially hit home because we had a little brief post where Archbishop Sammy wrote a letter about the uh, valiant Egyptian army and their glorious victory in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, which was recently celebrated last week. And for most Americans who are even moderately pro-Israel, or most Americans who follow the news, it wasn't an Egyptian victory. <laughs> uh, what happened is Israel, Israel captured the Golan Heights huh? and were initially pushed back, but managed to rally and drive the Egyptians out of all but a tiny bridgehead in the Sinai. And Henry Kissinger personally intervened and said, stop, don't defeat the Egyptian army. We've got them on the ropes. They'll negotiate with us now, but don't embarrass them like you're embarrassing the Syrians. Mm -hmm. So, hold on. If you not every, to not every global south pro, pro, in other words, you need to just the poli, uh, world politics does not walk hand in hand with theolog theological orthodoxy from an American perspective. From Sammy's perspective, they went to war. They didn't die. That's victory. Because, mm -hmm. you know, any Westerner who looks at that war at that time, uh, Egypt was going to push Israel into the sea. Mm -hmm. And that was their goal. We're wiping this off the face of the earth once and for all. And it didn't happen. And Israel survived to another day, to, to fight another day. And uh, it was an incredible embarrassment for Egypt. That's the history. And clearly, it's a history we learned in the West. Different history in Egypt. Egypt, I guess they teach that uh, Joseph and uh, uh, Jesus were refugees in, e in Egypt, and Egypt helped them. No, 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 no. That was Justin Welby. <laughs> Jesse Jackson was famous for saying at a Democratic National Convention that, after all, Mary was an unwed mother, too. Eh, Jesse, not in the way that you're talking about it. And Jesus was homeless. He would always say Jesus was yeah, homeless. Jesus yeah. was homeless. And the other big sort of liberal talking point is the uh, the news that Jesus was a refugee too. He, Mary and Joseph took Jesus and fled into Egypt when Herod was murdering the innocents. Uh, well, Jesus didn't stay in Egypt and collect government benefits and so on and so forth. And it's not the same thing but of course jesus was a refugee too says justin welby god uh, I, I, yeah and, and trust me egypt did not know jesus was there <laughs> otherwise Herod would have found out uh, but and they they didn't give him a free college education no no no, no. but and uh, jesus didn't chase down uh, a senator into a bathroom in cairo <sighs> crazy times it's so crazy that you and I can have a show talking about all things Anglican and people watch it. That's how crazy this, George. Any last stories? Yeah, we had one here. I saw uh, Ghana. You want to talk about it quick? Well, quick one, Ghana. Uh, Ghana is debating a uh, gay rights legislation uh, to bring Ghana in line with America, Britain, the EU are basically pressuring the Ghanaian government to adopt Western standards on homosexuality and marriage. And so the government is complying because they rely on aid and trade and the US and Britain can push them around. This was, this pressure was halted in the Trump administration, it was very strong in the Obama administration. Now it's back with a vengeance. So Ghana is on the radar of the liberals in the State Department. And so this pro-gay legislation allowing uh, gay marriage, gay rights, gay adoptions, all this stuff, is before the Ghanaian government. The Anglican Church in Ghana, the 12 Anglican dioceses in Ghana, and they form the Anglican internal province of West Africa, of Ghana, have come out saying, this is wrong. Uh, the Bible is quite clear on human sexuality and the teachings. We stand by the Bible, we stand by the official position of the Anglican Communion, and we urge our government to reject the gay rights, gay, the LGBT 
LGBTQ plus agenda being shoved down our throats by the West. We, we they're joined in this by the Catholic. They're joined in this by the Catholic Church and the Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it's going to pass in Ghana. So at least the Ga Ghanaian president can go back to the State Department and say, "Well, we tried, but we look, yeah, you know, listen, yeah, your we're mandate still a democracy. didn't work here. Yeah, we're still, we're still a democracy. <laughs> you can't tell us what to do that much." And uh, so this is. Uh, Oh, we, you know, this is the reality of the, on the ground in Africa that the U.S. and uh, the EU and Britain are twisting the arms, along with many, many international NGOs, are twisting the arms of governments to basically be recolonized. This time with not settlers on the ground, but ideologies on the ground. That you must, if you take our money and if you support and if you want us to play fairly with you, you must think as we do. You may not have an African approach to life. You must have an American or an English approach to life. And many, many African nations find this grossly offensive. And it's not working. And the church in Africa, parts of Africa, not South Africa, South Africa is divided yes. into liberal and conservative wings, has been standing up for the African uh, culture, African understanding of man's anthropology, relationship to God and to each other. So good news out of God. Yeah, it, 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 well, in reality, Anglican Unscripted episode 691 was a good news show. You know, uh, it, it just, it's a transparent show. We tell you the truth about uh, what we know and what you need to know. And uh, we try not to hold anything back, whether it's a, a character we love, like Michael Nazarali, uh, or a character we despise. I'm not going to name any names here. Nope, not going to name names. Or a wonderful fictional character named James T. Kirk. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Congard. You've been watching episode 692 of Anglican Unscripted.